This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Now it's time to introduce tonight's special guest. We're delighted to have Wayne Paselli with us tonight. Mr. Paselli is Senior Vice President of Communications and Government Affairs for the Humane Society of the United States, the nation's largest animal protection organization with more than 7 million members and constituents. Since 1990, he has conceived of or helped to direct more than a dozen successful ballot initiatives, including the recent ban of gestation crates for sows in Florida. He also led the fight in Congress to ban the interstate transportation of birds for fighting, a measure that should have a major impact on Hawaii's cockfighting industry. Mr. Paselli's work on ballot initiatives and other issues has been featured in hundreds of newsletters, newspapers, and magazines across the country. In addition, his media appearances, public speaking engagements, and lectures have garnered coverage for animal protection issues in hundreds of television, radio, newspaper, and magazine stories, nationally and locally, from the Today Show to the World News Tonight to Primetime Live. Mr. Paselli is chairman and founder of Humane USA, a political action committee that works to elect humane-minded candidates to public office and lobbies for vital animal protection legislation. He's a graduate of Yale University and a past national director of the Fund for Animals. Please welcome Wayne Paselli. very much. Well, thank you for that uh, very warm and kind introduction. Thank all of you for, uh, for being here tonight. It's uh, great to be back in Hawaii. It's been about a decade for me, and I am looking forward to seeing some old friends. Jim Brown, thank you for uh, helping make this possible and inviting me here along with the rest of the leadership of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Jim is a former resident of California. That's where I knew him when he was in San Diego. Jim, where, where are you? Where are you? Right You're right there. I'm sorry. I said there. You know, I don't, uh, you, you left California. I know they miss you. And, uh, you know, people have a lot of negative things to say about California. But after October 7th, Arnold says everything's going to be just fine in California. So, no. But I, I do travel around a bit. And this is a long trip for me. I always hate to leave my dog, you know, coming from the Humane Society. Sometimes you get animals that are a little bit uh, behaviorally challenged. And uh, I have a dog. He's a great dog. He's a wonderful dog. I love him. I miss him terribly. He's, uh, he's half pit bull and half St. Bernard. And uh, what he does, uh, it's, you know, he's a great dog. He, uh, he attacks people, but then he goes for help. And, uh, you know, he's a wonderful dog. You know, I, I just, I don't know if you heard the news. There was, uh, there's some news recently from In Defense of Animals. I'm sure many of you have heard of that organization. They have a guardian campaign. They're trying to get people to talk about animals in a different way rather than call them, you know, property or, or even pets. They want people to, you know, call them companion animals. And they want you not to be an owner but to be a guardian. I don't know if you heard the latest thing. You're not supposed to call a dog a dog anymore. You're supposed to call them a canine American. That's the latest thing from, from the... I'm very glad to be here and always glad to talk about animals because it's been a passionate concern of mine since, uh, since I can remember. I think so many of us have had deep-seated feelings uh, toward animals from a very, very young age. And I think that most kids have an innate sensitivity and sympathy for animals. And I think what happens to too many people is that we become inured to what happens to animals as culture tells us that animals are things to use. And I think what we're trying to do as a movement, all of us together, 
is really elevate the status of animals, not, of course, to denigrate human beings, but to see that animals get their rightful uh, place and they get uh, proper treatment. What we do to animals in this society really is staggering. You know, our language really reflects the biases and the prejudices that we exhibit toward non-human animals. And all you need to do is look at the different industries that use animals and look at the language that they use. In the research field, animals are often called tools for research. In the hunting or game management domain, again, they're called game animals to be harvested on a sustained yield basis, as if deer and ducks and other creatures are crops rather than uh, living mammals and birds and other creatures. In the industrial agriculture sector, they're called uh, units of production. They're not so much called animals anymore, but units, and they've been turned into meat, milk, and egg producing machines. And if we look at what we do to animals in terms of just the array of exploitation, it really is staggering, and I think it's important for us to take note of what is going on. Uh, Nine billion terrestrial mammals killed uh, every year, more than eight billion chickens, 100 million pigs, 35 million cattle, many millions of rabbits, goats, sheep, and the like. Nobody really has any idea how many fish are killed, but certainly in the billions. And if you just look at these raw numbers, more than 10 billion animals killed for food. This is more animals killed every year in the United States alone than there are people on the planet. Just think of the logistical exercise of killing that many creatures. Uh, We have really uh, turned these animals into just things to be used. And we're killing them not out of need, not out of necessity, uh, not because we have to, but essentially for gustatory or palate preference. We're doing it because we think that it tastes good to eat them, and we do it because that's what our culture has taught us. You know, I grew up with the food model that the U.S. Department of Agriculture developed, the basic four food groups. That was supposed to be the ideal construction of diet. At four basic food groups, you had your meat products, and you had your, your uh, dairy products and, and eggs, Then you had all of your fruits and vegetables in one category, and you had your grain products in another. And you were supposed to draw liberally from each of these food groups in order to be healthy. That had nothing to do with science. It had everything to do with the U.S. Department of Agriculture having a mission to promote American agriculture. And the way to promote American agriculture was to tell people that you had to eat these certain foods in order to be healthy. And we know, of course, that that basic four food groups has changed. It's now a food pyramid with meat at the top, occupying a narrower area on the food pyramid, but still it's very prominent there. And I work in Washington and see the influence of the pork industry and the cattle industry and the chicken industry, and they certainly do have their claws dug into the USDA dug into the government apparatus to promote the continuing uh, use of, uh, of animals. That's just agriculture, and we use animals in so many other ways. We use them for animal research, testing, and education uh, by the millions. Mice, birds, and rats are entirely excluded from any sort of protection under the Federal Animal Welfare Act. They are, of course, animals, but they're not considered animals under the definition of the Animal Welfare Act. So we have no numbers, no counting of how many mice, birds, and rats are used in research. There are more than 100 million animals killed in the U.S. every year for sport, sport hunting. The number one game species in the U.S. is the morning dove, 35 or 40 million morning doves shot. Uh, every year, a wounding rate of about 25%, so one of every four doves that's shot is injured and not retrieved. These birds are shot essentially for target practice. They're very small birds. There's hardly any meat on them. It it does amount to uh, just animated targets. There are also about 10 million quail killed, about 10 million pheasants, uh, six or so million ducks, a couple of million geese, and many other birds. In terms of the mammals, there are four million deer killed, There are several hundred thousand elk killed, more than 20,000 black bears, 1,500 mountain lions, 1,000 wolves, more than 1,000 grizzly bears, millions of rabbits and squirrels. There are millions of animals trapped in steel-jawed leg hole traps, conibear traps, uh, snares of the leg variety or the neck variety for their fur, for their pelts. There are animals used in entertainment. Animals are used in rodeos. Animals are used in circuses, elephants, 
carted around on chains from city to city, Ringling Brothers and uh, Clyde Beatty Cole and others moving these animals from city to city, these animals knowing chains 22 hours a day, and it is certainly no fun life for any of those creatures. So all of the myriad ways in which we use animals, your introductory speaker here mentioned cockfighting, and uh, there's also its, uh, its evil kin dogfighting. Many people think these are relics of a past time, but these are very widespread activities. There was an outbreak of a disease in Southern California called exotic Newcastle disease. It's a bird disease, a respiratory disease, and it appears that cockfighters move from birds, move birds from Mexico into Southern California, It began to spread throughout Southern California and the state and federal authorities had to attempt to kill birds to contain the spread of the disease and they killed about 3.8 million birds in the process of of containing this disease. They also spent $110 million, our federal tax dollars, compensating people, including a third of the people that they were compensating were illegal cockfighters and the federal government which was with the state going from door to door to try to educate people and also depopulate or kill these birds, says there are 50,000 cockfighting operations in Southern California alone. And nobody had any idea that there was that much cockfighting activity going on. Here in Hawaii, it's obviously a major, major industry in this state. It's a launching point to the Pacific Rim uh, countries. There are birds that move from Hawaii to the mainland. There are birds that move to the Philippines and to Guam and really throughout the world. All of these industries basically operating on the same principle, that animals are things to use, that they are here for our use. And if they they adapt sometimes our language about treating animals well and humanely, we only need to look at what they're doing to see that that is absolutely not true. Our movement is one that is based on the principle of altruism. That we're not doing this for profit. We're not all, this, this group is one of the thousands of groups across the country uh, driven by volunteers where people take money out of their own pockets. They take time from, from their busy days to do something good for other creatures. And it's a simple principle that animals are not so different from us. That is the basic sensibility that animates so much of our activism. And, you know, I think one of the most significant figures historically for us was Charles Darwin. In 1859, he wrote The Origin of Species. In 1871, he wrote The Descent of Man. And he argued that there was a unity and continuity to life, that we are not so different from the rest of the non-human animal creation, that we are not fallen angels but risen apes, and that we are so similar to other animals in basic attributes that it is very difficult to, uh, to say that we are made out of some entirely different cloth. And I think that the animal rights movement, the animal protection movement, whatever you want to call it, its task is really grappling with the moral implications of Darwinism. If we accept that other animals come from the same constituent parts, if they have nerve endings, if they have a central nervous system, then how can we possibly justify this differential treatment where we recognize that individual human beings have autonomy, they want to live, they have that spark that animates every life form, and we respect that individual. We say, no, you're not allowed to harm that individual for profit, for amusement, for whatever purpose you might ascribe to it. You're not allowed to do it because we recognize that the individual person has certain basic rights. How can we then say, if animals are composed of the same constituent parts as humans, that we ignore these basic principles of respect for the individual? I don't think we can, and I think that over time we are going to prevail, partly because we've already accepted in the society the basic tenets of respect for individuals. You know, every state in this country has an anti-cruelty statute, all 50 of them. And those anti-cruelty statutes say that it is wrong to needlessly or gratuitously harm animals. You're not allowed to overwork, to overdrive, to mutilate, to torment, to torture. You look at the statutes, it has all sorts of verbs to identify the activities that are prescribed to prevent people from harming animals for needless or gratuitous reasons. Well, the fact is, almost every use of animals in this culture is needless and gratuitous. We're doing it out of habit, We're doing it for profit. 
We're doing it because it's been done a long time. It's not essential for our existence. And we're building a body of law in this country that is starting to expand those protections to other creatures. There are 50 states that have anti-dog fighting laws. 48 states have anti-cock fighting laws. Just Louisiana and New Mexico permit that activity now. There are all sorts of other laws that have been developed to recognize that we have responsibilities to other creatures and that you can't just exhibit libertarian behavior. You can't say, well, if I want to do it, well, that's my preference and therefore I should be allowed to do it. That is not going to win the day. That idea is gone in terms of general animal principles. Now we just need to logically extend it beyond just dogs and cats. It's not just dogs and cats and horses that should have protection. It's the rest of the animal creation that deserves the basic protections as well. And you know, we only need to look at some of the animals and their attributes to see uh, how similar they are to us. And also, how much human beings who are trying to preserve the status quo try to differentiate ourselves from the rest of the animal kingdom in order to justify the continuing torment and torture of animals. You know, you can look to chimpanzees. People said, well, you know, humans and chimps are so different in so many ways. And then scientists pointed out that the genetic material of chimps mirrors our own to some great degree. 98% of the genetic material is similar. Then people said, well, the difference between us and, and, uh, and chimps is language. We're capable of language and chimps aren't. And I used to work at the Fund for Animals. They had a now deceased chimp named Nim Chimsky. He was named after the linguist Noam Chomsky. And Nim knew 120 ASL signs, American Sign Language signs. And Nim communicates, or communicated, and so many other chimps do, kind of tearing down that wall. Then people said, well, the difference between us and them is that, uh, that we use tools and chimps don't. And then Jane Goodall, in her work in Africa, pointed out that, yes, in fact, chimps do use tools. And I guess chimps would really be like us if they borrowed tools and didn't return them. But, you know, we are similar to them in almost all of the basic attributes. And again, it's not a question of whether someone can, a creature can compose a sonnet or write literature or develop a hydrogen bomb. Those are interesting biographical attributes or those are interesting things that some creatures can do and some cannot do. But the basic element, which Peter Singer argued in 1975 in his very important book, Animal Liberation, which others have reiterated since that time, is the capacity to experience pleasure and pain. The ability to be a sentient creature, to have a sentient existence. And again, if these creatures feel pain and they suffer, why would we needlessly inflict harm upon them? That's the basic, simple idea. You know, you don't have to be an intellectual to be an advocate of animals. All you have to do is have a little bit of common sense and a little bit of decency. Because we're just extending these basic humane principles and trying to now logically apply them to all of the animals uh, that we uh, interact with and encounter. And you know, in the animal agriculture field, it's, it's important for us to talk a little bit more about what's going on here, because here we see a real moral race to the bottom. We see animals reduced to just parts, and we see industries that exhibit uh, absolutely no concern for the well-being and welfare of animals. And it's most acute with egg-laying hens and with uh, birds raised for meat, and with pigs raised for, for, uh, for their flesh. And just to speak about these issues for, for a few minutes, you know, we have transformed these animals. All of the modern animals, all the, the animals that are, that are uh, reared on farms these days, descended from wild animals. You know, they weren't just created out of whole cloth. They were animals that over thousands of years were domesticated, and we have, we have reshaped them to some degree, but they are fundamentally similar to their wild antecedents, to their forebears. And it is really astonishing that we have changed them, though, in certain ways. Take the turkey, for example. Turkeys kill to the tune of more than 250 million birds a year. Of course, a, a feature of one of our holidays, Thanksgiving, where it's not a normal holiday if you don't have a turkey on the plate, according to many people. 
You know, turkeys in the wild, one of the native, a bird native to the United States, and I don't know if you have wild turkeys here in, in Hawaii, probably not, but we've got them on the mainland throughout the continental United States. And for people who hunt them, and certainly I'm not among them, but for people who hunt them, if you know anything about turkey hunting, people who pursue turkeys dress in full camouflage. They do it in the spring, oftentimes, sometimes in the fall. They dress in full camouflage. They put on face paint, and they go out with a little turkey calling device, and they stay absolutely still, except for their, their blowing into the turkey calling device to mimic the sound of other turkeys to draw them in. But the turkeys are so alert, so aware of their environment that a small movement will cause them to run and fly away, eluding, allowing them to elude the hunter so he doesn't kill the bird. So the animals are alert, they're fast flying, they're fast running. Contrast that with the turkey that's in the modern industrial factory farm. These birds, through selective breeding, have morphed into Frankenstein monsters. They are so obese and so overly muscled with their breasts that they can barely stand. Their legs often cannot support them. They are incapable of normal reproduction. They are asexual biomachines. The, the toms are not impregnating the females on your modern turkey farm. The females are artificially inseminated because they are just too obese to, to produce. They die of heart attacks at a very young age. They have no resemblance, just in terms of just your basic taking a look at these birds, to the wild uh, antecedents. We have turned them into animals uh, that are used just for production and just for their muscly uh, breasts and other body parts for our food. We've transformed the chicken, the, the red jungle fowl, the wild uh, chicken from East Asia, doesn't bear a great resemblance to the chickens that you'll find on modern chicken farms. And on and on and on, the pigs, while they exhibit many of the same sorts of natural behaviors and instincts, uh, they look very different. By the way, I do want to mention there's a book coming out uh, this fall, Jeffrey Mason. He wrote several books, When Elephants Weep. Some of you may have uh, seen that book, Dogs Never Lie About Love and the Nine Emotional Lives of Cats. He has a new book about the emotional lives of farm animals called The Pig Who Sang to the Moon. And he recounts, this is a review copy I just read flying over here, he recounts so many stories of animals like the, uh, the cow Emily in Massachusetts who was in a slaughter line. She had seen, she was witnessing animals ahead of her being slaughtered and she broke away jumped over a five-foot fence, this is a, an adult uh, cow, jumped over that fence, uh, ran into the woods, and was on the lamb for, uh, for 40 days before she was captured, evading and eluding a massive cow hunt, if you will, to try to uh, bring her back. The slaughterhouse owner really wanted to get her back, uh, but she eluded people for 40 days in a pretty well-developed area of Massachusetts. You know, it wasn't that she just got scared, and, you know, was startled. She wanted to save her life. You know, she was in that line. She saw the animals being slaughtered ahead of her, and she ran for her life. And she was a smart enough creature to have eluded people for 40 days, and fortunately, it has a happy ending. She uh, went to a, uh, the Peace Abbey in Massachusetts, where she's living out the remainder of her life. But Jeffrey Mason recounts that story, he recounts the stories of chickens who make great companions, pigs who make great companions, who are wonderfully intelligent uh, creatures. And to think of what we do to them, how we've manipulated their bodies so they're in constant pain, these turkeys and these chickens. Uh, chickens, again, dying of heart attacks at six weeks of age. I mean, these are juveniles. They're not even adolescents. They're juveniles. Uh, dying of heart attacks. We have done so much to their body, transforming them into instrumentalities for our purposes, that we have sacrificed their health and their basic well-being. And then we, we augment the indignities and we augment the cruelties by putting them in these intensive confinement conditions where pigs are put in, the, the breeding sows are put in gestation crates, the two-foot by seven-foot cages where they can't even turn around the most basic animal behavior of turning around or lying down normally 
They can't do it. They're on these slatted concrete floors where their waste falls below them. And pigs, contrary to common perceptions, are very clean animals. They don't defecate and urinate in the areas where they sleep. But they have no choice in these environments where they're not allowed to move. The sow is pregnant for about four months, and she's in this crate. Just a week before she gives birth, she's moved to a different type of crate, a farrowing crate. And there she produces her piglets. The piglets nurse with her for just a short time. Then she's artificially inseminated again and put back into the gestation crate. It's a cycle she may go through seven or eight or nine or ten times before she's spent and then slaughtered and turned into a low-grade pork product. So here's an intelligent animal, a conscious animal, a sentient animal, trapped in a cage for up to three years at a time. The madness, the frustration that these highly cognitive creatures endure uh, causes them to engage in stereotype behaviors where the sow will chew on the bars endlessly in her cage. Sometimes she will just chew into the air, a practice known as sham chewing. She will just wave her head sometimes back and forth. And then the physical ailments, the emotional burdens are enough, but then the physical ailments without any exercise, her muscles atrophy, bone density is depleted causing hip problems and joint problems and other sorts of problems and we're talking about five million sows who are in these gestation crates at this very time five percent of the u.s uh, pig population spends its time in these gestation crates perhaps even you know it's hard to compare these cruelties it's hard to say well this practice is worse than this other practice But certainly egg-laying hens, a lot of people, when they turn vegetarian, and I applaud applaud anyone who takes any step in this regard. If you are a vegan, that's great. If you've moved moved toward vegetarianism, that's great. If you've reduced your consumption of animal products, that's outstanding too because you're on the right path. But a lot of people then, if they opt for no meat, sometimes they will substitute the eggs and the dairy products. Well, the eggs that are produced in this country come from tormented creatures. There's just no question about it. 250 uh, million egg-laying hens producing five or six eggs a week. You know, egg production is an ovulation, and the females have a cycle every once in a while. They're not supposed to do this five or six times a week. It depletes their calcium. It stresses their system. It's a terrible burden, this hyper-reproduction that we've bred into these animals. Beyond that, we put them in battery cages, small cages. The the floor space may be the size of the front page of the Honolulu Advertiser. Six or seven or eight birds crammed into this cage. In this very strange and unusual environment, they can't establish their normal social hierarchy, their pecking order. So they engage in cannibalistic behavior, pecking each other to death. And the response of the industrial animal factory farmer is not to move to a more extensive system but to keep the intensive system but then to mutilate the animal to cram the animal into this system so it can continue so they chop off the animal's beak a highly sensitive cartilage filled portion of their body and makes it difficult for them to feed in their normal way it makes everything every element of the industrial form makes life difficult for these creatures. Many people are aware of the abuse that young male calves uh, endure for the veal industry, and certainly you know, a lot of Americans are aware of veal, and many of them have taken steps to eliminate veal from their diet, but the treatment that pigs and chickens endure is arguably just as bad. And, you know, a lot of people also look to, to fish as an alternative. There was an editorial I saw in the advertiser today about fish farming, and it was the advertiser was lauding the prospect of more fish farming as an alternative to the normal way that we catch fish because almost every observer, anybody who's awake, has realized what we're doing to the marine life of this world. We are absolutely pillaging and depleting and mining the fish species of this world. You know, if you look at so many of these problems are derivative 
of human population growth. You know, humans have been around for more than two million years, and for most of human history, we were hunters and gatherers, living in low densities, moving around a considerable amount of the time. And the big change happened 10,000 years ago when we began to domesticate plants and animals. And when we did that, we were allowing animals to be with us. So they were, they were uh, some people have called, the, called them portable bags of protein. We raised them and we took them with us and we domesticated plants. So that allowed people not to have to move around so much, but to cultivate these plants and to exploit the animals. So you didn't have to be nomadic. It allowed population growth to occur. It allowed the development of communities that were sedentary, eventually cities and states. And, you know, it took from 2 million years to 1870 for us to get to the 1 billion mark in terms of human population. It then took just another 70 years to 1940 for us to double and to reach 2 billion. 3 billion came just 20 years later in 1960. 4 billion came in 1974, just 14 years after that. 5 billion came in 1989. And 6 billion came in 1999, and we continue to climb. And this is on a planet where 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Of the 30% remaining, much of that is rock and ice. So we've crammed 6 billion people and counting onto this planet, and we're adding another Mexico, 80 million people a year, uh, to this planet. And if you look at the fish issue, you have factory fishing as the new strategy for exploiting the marine resources of the world. And it's particularly acute for those countries and those people living uh, near the sea, because it's obviously been done for a long time. We're trawling, which means you have a couple of boats and you have a uh, net between that basically uh, mines the, the, uh, the ocean bottom. And shrimp, you know, a lot of people eat shrimp, of course. Don't give that a big thought. Well, they're just shrimp, not very uh, cognitively developed. For every pound of shrimp that's caught, three to 15 pounds of bycatch is, uh, is part of that haul. That's turtles, that's dolphins, that's almost any animal in the wake of the shrimp trawling apparatuses. You know, we've depleted the bluefin tuna, we've depleted swordfish. 70% of the uh, fisheries of the world are severely depleted. We are absolutely mining. It's a case of the tragedy of the commons marrying industrial production. And uh, fish is not a great alternative. And, you know, a lot of people often say, well, I gave up beef. Well, if you looked at, at this just in terms of a suffering calculus, and you know there are flaws to doing it that way, the average American, you know, the figures vary. Some people say the average American in a regular diet eats something like 83 animals a year. It's a portion, a small portion of a cow, a portion of a pig, it's a few dozen chickens, and then fish and other creatures. So by going to the fish and the chickens as an alternative, we're actually taking uh, many more, many more lives. So I, I just go through that scenario to, to talk about our food choices and our ethical responsibilities and to really uh, make the point that it's very difficult to find a humane way or even a sustainable way to take uh, these creatures in this day and age. You know, there are all sorts of collateral effects of rearing animals in this way. There are devastating environmental consequences of concentrating animals on these animal factories. There's just a, an operation in Ohio, Buckeye Egg, one of the biggest egg producers in the U.S. They've been polluting the local community. The state of Ohio has just ordered them shut down. 14 million birds have to be killed. This is a calamity. It's an animal welfare calamity. It's an environmental calamity. And obviously, and I know as most of you are members of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, there are also the health effects. Uh, we are not designed to consume other animals in a comfortable fashion. It certainly shouldn't be a preponderance of our diet. You could argue that we're designed to have some of uh, these animals without having enormously ill effects, but 
at the level that we consume these animals, the high fat, the cholesterol, we see so many human health problems deriving from excess consumption of, of animals. And again, what we also see is that when people go vegetarian, or better yet, go vegan, there are all sorts of health benefits as a consequence of that food choice. And it's just an ethical uh, response if you're concerned about animals. And, you know, this is one of the most culturally complex sorts of issues that we deal with. And so many of the issues that we deal with are complex. You know, most of us, I'm sure 97% of, of the vegetarians here, started off eating meat. And many of us got off of it into adulthood. You know, we have to be very careful about not pointing too many fingers at, at, at people. We can't be too doctrinaire. Uh, and we cannot uh, be too accusatory uh, toward uh, other folks because sometimes it takes people a little while to see uh, what's going on. Now, it's important to affirmatively state your case. It's important to tell people what's going on and what sort of uh, cruelty is being perpetuated through our dietary practices. But we have to balance our impatience with a little bit of tolerance as well. Uh, because this is a deeply ingrained activity. What we eat is very personal for people. And uh, it's obviously been going on a heck of a long time. It's not going to change overnight. But there are all signs, all sorts of signs of positive change. And, you know, while it's very depressing to look at the array of animal abuse that occurs and the numbers of people that are populating this planet in terms of so many people extracting so many resources, it's easy to become pessimistic. At the same time, there are all sorts of signs of positive change. You know, I became a vegetarian 19 and a vegan 19 years ago, and at that time, it was, it was tougher to be vegetarian. Now I can travel around and go to vegdining.com, and find vegetarian restaurants in almost any community in this, in this country or at least options that are, that are available in mainstream uh, supermarkets and health food stores. Even Burger King now has a veggie burger. Uh, McDonald's and all of its California uh, outlets has veggie burgers. If you go to an airport and go to Chili's or Ruby Tuesdays or so many other outlets that have these options, so much of this is a factor of convenience. And when people have easy options for pursuing vegetarian foods, then it's going to make it all the uh, easier for people to uh, gravitate uh, toward that lifestyle. You know, 20 years ago, there were just a small number of companies that weren't testing their products on animals. Now there are hundreds of companies that are not testing their products uh, on animals. There are all sorts of new laws being passed in the 106th Congress, 1999, 2000, there were uh, 12 new laws passed to protect animals. There are more bills being introduced in every state legislature on animal protection than ever before. And if you look at just the number of people engaged and involved, the group that I work for, the Humane Society of the U.S., has 7 million members and constituents. That's one group among 5,000 organizations that have been constituted to improve the lives of animals, whether they're wildlife rehabilitators or local vegetarian societies or whether they're anti-vivisection groups or working against the use of animals entertainment. 5,000 groups. This idea is not just sprouting. This is a movement that has really penetrated every corner of this country you know, this is a movement that is challenging so many different ways of using animals. So many aspects of animal use are major economic engines of local communities or states or entire regions of the country. We're talking about deep-seated cultural attitudes that go back thousands of years that animals were put on this planet for us to use. We've had religion reinforce these ideas. We've had political systems reinforce these ideas. We have government continuing to subsidize uh, these uh, practices and ideas. It doesn't happen overnight. But the changes are evident wherever you look. There are several movies out right now in terms of looking at popular culture. Legally Blonde 2, Reese Witherspoon, the star, uh, goes to Washington, D.C. to lobby for a ban on animal testing. Finding Nemo uh, talks about fish and protecting fish. Television shows 
involve animal themes more and more. There's more news coverage. You can go to dawnwatch.org. It's a newsletter produced that reports on animals in the media. And there's not a day, you know, it's, it's rare that there's not a major story about animals in the news on a particular day. The signs of change are all around us. And, you know, that said, it's not a self-executing movement. You know, the idea is good and the idea is sound. And I, I believe, I'm extremely confident about the ethical principles that undergird this movement. And I think that it's very hard to argue against these principles. I see it every day when people try to defend these activities. You know, their arguments are so parochial, they're so narrow, they're not logical. That said, there are people who are defending the status quo. They have a lot of money and they are prepared to fight to retain these activities. And the only way it changes is if people participate. And participation takes many forms. You know, we ask a lot of people who are animal advocates. You know, we ask people to think about dietary choices because, again, we look at the supply and demand issue. If an average person in a year eats 80 or 83 or 85 animals, whatever that number is, by abstaining from that, in a supply and demand economy, you can spare those animals' uh, lives simply by your own action of abstaining. Then you can also educate people, you can educate family members, and they're sometimes the most difficult people to educate. You can educate members of your community, like you're doing with the Vegetarian Society of, of, uh, of Hawaii or the Hawaiian Humane Society, or the other excellent groups that are working to educate people about animals. We also ask people and really urge people in the most strenuous terms to get involved in the political process. You know, democracy, a representative government, is not a spectator sport, it's a participatory sport. And it's better and stronger when people participate. And one of the terrible things that's going on in this country is there's enormous indifference about the political world. Only half of eligible voters go to the polls and vote. Now, that's a terrible statement about the lack of confidence that people have in the political system today. But it also for us is an opportunity. That means that half the people aren't participating. If we really participate, if we have maximum participation, 100% participation from people who are animal advocates, then we can much more readily and easily influence political outcomes. You know, we work against the National Rifle Association, which defends practices like bear baiting or canned hunting, where animals are released in fenced enclosures and shot for a fee and a guaranteed kill. We work against the American Farm Bureau or the National Pork Producers Council, which defends gestation crates and other industrial methods. They're all playing the political game, not because it's fun for them or because it's amusing for them. They're playing the political game because they realize that's what works. That's what allows them to continue to do what they're doing. And we would be naive to think that our participation couldn't yield similar dividends in that respect. And that's why I'm working with a lot of folks across the country on a group called Humane USA. We're, we're at humaneusa.org, and we're working to elect candidates to office at the state and federal levels, principally, who care about animals. People who will not just vote for animal protection, but will be leaders on animal protection, advocating for a ban on gestation crates, advocating for a ban on battery cages, trying to stop canned hunts or bear baiting, or to strengthen laws against cockfighting and dogfighting, puppy mills, use of elephants in circuses, the abuse of animals in rodeo. There is no question in my mind that we can succeed if we align ourselves. You've got a great animal advocate in your federal congressional delegation in Daniel Akaka. He's the author of the Downed Animal Protection Act. He historically has been one of the strongest animal advocates. Senator uh, Daniel Inouye is often supportive as well. He signed on recently to the new federal bill to make it a federal felony to move birds for fighting purposes across state or national lines. That's a big deal in a state like Hawaii, which has an active cockfighting community. Neil Abercrombie, one of your representatives, he has historically had a good record. Unfortunately, he just voted against us 
on an issue on bear baiting. He voted uh, against an amendment to stop bear baiting on federal lands, and he also voted against an amendment providing enforcement dollars for animal fighting. Uh, so you should contact him and ask him why he did that and uh, let him know that you're not happy about that. Your new, the new representative re- representing the rest of the islands and a portion of Oahu, Ed Case, has generally been with us so far in the early votes, but it's important for you to communicate with these folks. And it's important to be involved. It's important for people to run for office. If you care about animals, you know, take that plunge yourself. An advocate in the state legislature can do wonders uh, for animal protection. Many people, certainly all of us here, and many others would be convinced by just sensibilities about kindness and compassion and respect. But we live in a representative democracy where there is conflict between different interest groups. And we have to trump those other groups in terms of political organizing and political activity, as well as make good logical arguments and good practical arguments. And I think we can do that. It's very easy to get depressed about Uh, animal issues, when you think about all of the different types of cruelties that are perpetrated against animals, and you think, my God, it's so overwhelming. But, you know, every person who does a simple act for animals makes the difference in the lives of those individual creatures. If you spay or neuter your companion animal and prevent reproduction from occurring, you're sparing those animals that would be born potentially a, uh, a troublesome uh, life. If you go vegan and stop eating eggs and dairy products and meat products, you're sparing animals' lives directly. If you purchase products that are not tested on animals through the marketplace, you are saving animals' lives. Every action that you take that improves the lives of animals is in itself an enormous victory. And I like a quote from Emily Dickinson, very much I'd like to read for you as a way I think toward trying to inspire you to take every small or big action that you can take to improve the lives of animals and realize that each one of those actions has its own importance she wrote if I can stop one heart from breaking I shall not live in vain if I can ease one life the aching or cool one pain or help one fainting robin into his nest again I shall not live in vain. So I don't think any of us are living in vain. You're doing such great work by advocating for the less powerful, uh, for those who can't speak for themselves. And my urging is that you just continue to raise your voice. You've got a great argument. We've got a great cause. And we will prevail. Thanks very much. Does anybody have any questions? The Humane Society of the U.S., probably like the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, is a 501c3 organization under the Internal Revenue Service and therefore is strictly forbidden from favoring or opposing candidates. It's just part of the strictures that these groups operate with. Now, Humane USA doesn't have those strictures. Now, we haven't, we haven't taken a formal position, but I will just give you a little background on the candidates because we're, we're still deliberating and we welcome feedback and participation. Dennis Kucinich, who's a representative from Ohio, is an outstanding animal advocate. He's a four or five term U.S. representative. Kucinich is, is a guy who's been an advocate of animals since the very beginning of his time in Congress, and he is the only admitted vegan in Congress. Perhaps there are some others uh, who, who, uh, who are vegan. The downside of Kucinich at this time, just being perfectly candid, is that he's considered a real long shot for winning the race. But clearly on the issues and in terms of personal lifestyle, he's the strongest candidate. Senator John Kerry has also been a very major leader on animal rights issues in the Congress. He was the author of an amendment to halt the subsidy for the mink industry, fought for that on the floor. It won in the Senate, won in the House, became uh, law. He's also been a leader on several other major issues. He introduces bills, he speaks on the floor. 
a very strong advocate. Joe Lieberman has also been a very consistent advocate for animals. John Edwards, Senator of North Car- from North Carolina, has been pretty good. He comes from a state that's got a very big hunting lobby, trapping lobby, a lot of cockfighting. So he ha- his record hasn't been quite as good, but we hold out a lot of promise for him as well. So it's all taking shape, but go to humaneusa.org and read about their, read about their, their uh, activities for animals. And we'll probably make an endorsement sometime before the Iowa caucuses, which are January, February of 2004. That's the first kind of tabulation of votes. Then they, they're on to New Hampshire and then to South Carolina. President Bush has not been uh, very exemplary uh, thus far on animal issues, although I will mention that one of his major speechwriters, his senior speechwriter, Matthew Scully, who doesn't have a direct impact on policy in terms of a formal uh, position, he's written an incredible book called Dominion. It is one of the most powerful books that's ever been written about animals, but President Bush has not been good. He came out, the administration has opposed anti-bear baiting legislation. The administration also has opposed legislation to ban the interstate movement of big cats like lions and tigers for the pet trade. We have a bill that's progressing very well. We think it's going to pass to stop people from keeping lions and tigers as pets. There are 15,000 people who keep lions and tigers as pets in the U.S. The administration testified against that bill, amazingly enough. We think we'll turn them around when it gets to uh, President Bush's uh, desk for his signature, but uh, not been very positive and um, very close to the the industries that uh, harm animals, including the Safari Club International, where he was a past speaker, and uh, his father was a regular speaker. Safari Club International is an international trophy hunting organization. They have 29 hunting award categories. One of them, for instance, is the Africa Big Five. In order to get this award, you have to shoot a lion, a leopard, an elephant, a rhino, and a Cape buffalo. And if you do that, then you get the award. They have 29 different awards, like bears of the world. You have to shoot five of the eight bears of the world. Cats of the world, you have to shoot five of the great cats, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a despicable group and one that we're, uh, we're very much opposed to its agenda. All the way in the back. That's a, that's a mouthful. There were several questions there. One was about the Humane Society membership and its obedience to vegetarian principles. You know, we haven't actually done a survey, but my guess is 80% plus are, are not vegetarians. We're doing our best. Well, I shouldn't say we're doing our best. We need to do even more to elevate uh, these issues in terms of our membership. You know, a lot of people join the Humane Society because of their affinity and it's an affinity we applaud and encourage toward dogs and cats and traditional companion animals. And, you know, sometimes they don't even realize that we work on the wide range of issues, that we have a wildlife department, that we have a farm animal sustainable agriculture section. So we need to do more in that regard. And I think they probably mirror American culture to some considerable degree, where they have very compassionate instincts, but don't necessarily logically apply the principles to all animals. Most hunters will attempt to justify the hunting activity by trying to attach social benefits to it. And one of the most compelling social benefits that they try to attach is that they're serving some population control function and that they're doing the animals a service, ironically enough, by shooting them with muzzle loaders or broadhead arrows or bullets or whatever weapon they choose to use. Three million American hunters use handguns these days, so they can shoot them with handguns, rifles, muzzle loaders, bows and arrows, you name it. You know, almost all of the animals hunted, there's no credible argument that can be made for population control. You certainly can't argue that doves or ducks or pheasants or quail or even some of the smaller mammals like rabbits and squirrels need to be shot to control their numbers. You know, they're just randomly shooting these animals. They're, they don't have any specific kill objectives. They don't have any population estimates. and amounts to random killing that the populations may be able to sustain and not be entirely depleted, but that ignores the humane question, which is our principal objection to the hunting issue. Now, on the mainland, the big issue, especially in the east, is deer and white-tailed deer and the argument that they're controlling deer populations. And that's a very complex issue, which I won't be able to go into in great depth. But let me just suffice to say that game, the modern system of game management developed in this country in the 30s as a response to the over-exploitation of game animals or animals in the latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, when we killed them for their hides, 
buffalo for their tongues. So many animals for different parts where the parts were commercially sold and that led to an over-exploitation of the populations. The modern system of game management was developed to rationalize the kill to allow it to occur year after year after year in order to, to encourage annual hunting participation, the sale of hunting licenses to fund state fish and game agencies. So these agencies have operated in a very symbiotic relationship with the hunting community where the regulators and the regulator are the same people. So it was the hunting community and the state fish and game agencies that have deliberately attempted to inflate deer population numbers so they could increase hunting success rates in order to sell more hunting licenses. So Pennsylvania, for instance, which has a million deer hunters, more deer hunters than there are members of the Standing Army of the United States, they still have 60 or 70,000 deer auto collisions a year, which suggests that their favored management option, which is allowing a million hunters to shoot principally bucks, does not mitigate or solve all the deer human conflicts that exist. So it's a very complex issue. I'd advise going to the hsus.org website. It gets more complex when you have introduced species. And in Hawaii, you have a lot of introduced species and a lot of problems associated with the very unique ecosystems that you have, that have there. The, other, the, question, the question is about contraception as a population control strategy that is a humane strategy. Contraception has some potential application for certain animals. It's used widely now in zoos. We're working with about 90 zoos to use contraception to control any surplus breeding in these zoos because sometimes the zoos, they're producing young animals to draw visitors and then they sell the surplus to exotic animal dealers who then sell animals into the pet trade or they sell them to canned hunting operations or they sell them to others who exploit the creatures. So, in captive settings, it can be useful. In some wild settings, it can be useful. It's best used on deer in island ecosystems where you can kind of control the numbers and know which animals have been contracepted. It's used with wild horses in the West to some considerable degree. No, you do know that I'm talking about the contraceptive vaccine. Yeah, yeah it's a non-hormonal vaccine, right. Right, it's delivered through a dart gun, and they're, they're working on better delivery systems these days. So it has some application. Viral transmission is one of the options. You splice the, the PZP into the, the virus and, and spread it around the animal by natural infection. Yes. Well, thank you again for being here tonight. Thank you for supporting the... Thank you, uh, Wayne. That was so informative. Uh, please enjoy the refreshments uh, courtesy of Down to Earth. Visit our book table. Become a member if you haven't. And please join us again next month. Thank you. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.